I couldn't print my notes today, so I went ahead and left them on my computer. If this is a curse to you and you think that this little sign right here is actually causing a major issue in our service, then our God would be weak, would he not? <clears throat> Eve ate the apple, didn't she? <laughs> the knowledge of good and evil, my goodness. How much better would it be to just be in a state where we only know good? We only know the goodness of God and we don't see the evil and the destruction and, and all that. But then we wouldn't know what is good if we didn't have that contrast, would we? We would actually probably desire other things. I don't think that there would be any difference. We would all do the same thing that Adam and Eve did. You know that, don't you? It's interesting how we can think, why wouldn't do that? But in that environment at that time, we would have done the same thing. The sad thing is, if we think that we wouldn't, then we think very highly of ourselves. Because we're saying that in this life, we would only serve the Lord. We would only do good. They had a perfect environment where there's no evil. And yet we find ourselves discounting the things that we watch, the things that we read, the things that we entertain, the hatred and anger that we have, all kinds of things. They can be small and this, that, and the other, but then we would still say, I wouldn't do it. My goodness, we would, we would. And we're not gonna be too hard on them. They did it in a perfect environment and we do it just at will. Um, in this uh, study, as we're going forward, I've been writing a paper for school and uh, it's called Order in the House. And uh, Order in the House, the House of God. And it's been interesting because it starts with these doctrines of demons that actually get into the church. And in the past, there's been a few things that I've taught on before as far as discipline in the church and how that is to be organized. And I want to bring it straight out of scripture because today we have a church that is very disorderly and uh, at large, and we know it, honestly. We know that there's some major problems in the church here in America. Anybody else or is it just me? I'm the only one that recognizes that. And, you know, you go to work and you get a manual and you get you go to the military and you get an operations manual and you get all these things and there are rules and there's regulations and there are people that actually enforce those policies called managers or presidents of the company, whatever it is, uh, non-commissioned officers, officers, COs, generals, whomever that may be, there's definitely a system and a flow and those things are honored. I know it from the military. Um, even if you disagreed, it was very, very difficult. There was uh, a time where there was uh, my non-commissioned officer in charge, my NCOIC who was above me, was being very, very aggressive towards one of my men. And uh, this gentleman struggled with his run and he struggled with other things, but I spent every day with him and was training him every day to be uh, a man of integrity in the battlefield and hoping that he would be a man of integrity as best I knew integrity at the time, because we represented what I believed at the time was the best nation in the world. And this gentleman who was my, uh, my supervisor, if you will, really started going after him and was making him do things that he wasn't asking anybody else to do. And I had to step in and I had to put myself in that place where he was, I was taking the heat and ultimately found myself before the first sergeant and the captain as an insubordinate non-commissioned officer that I was not following commands. And I pleaded that this was not a lawful command, that there was abuse that was taking place and this needed to be addressed. And whatever comes on me comes on me but I can't sit idle by and allow someone to be abused, especially under my charge. All said and done, this person didn't like me that much, but 
as it worked out, whatever problem he had with this individual was wrongly placed and he had to, to let up on him and allow him to do the PT test according to the way it needed to be done. He was really going to make him fail is what was ultimately gonna happen. And I couldn't allow that. So much so that I ran with him during that PT test. And when I completed my run, I still saw that he had two laps to go. And I ran with, with him with everything I had and said, follow me, follow me. And I pushed myself to a point of exhaustion, running two extra laps so that he would finish on time. I wish the church would start doing this for others. It breaks my heart to see these things. And I ask God, please release me from this burden. And he says, no, it's good. Okay. I share that story because the church is under attack by seducing spirits. And as a pastor, I try so hard to try to run alongside and to try to give guidance, even to the point that I'll take the heat. If I can take the heat, Lord, let me receive it and take these burdens off of your people. But we all have decisions to make, don't we? So the Lord tells me, preach the truth. Preach the truth. Preach the truth and I will work with them. Amen. Is that gonna keep me from running alongside of them with everything I got? No. Did I really wanna do it then? No, I didn't, I was tired. I ran a good time. I'd already done my push-ups and my sit-ups and I ran my time so that my score was excellent and saw that he was still struggling. I was like, no, no. I will run alongside of him and I will uplift him the best I can and if that requires some, some special sacrifice on my part, then I will do that. What I see in the church today is very little sacrifice for others and a lot of edification of self. I'm so thankful that the Lord tells me it's not about me. It's not about me. Even this burden that I share with you, it's not about me. I want to honor the Lord. Do you? I don't want to be right. I want to live righteously before God in him alone. And people say all kinds of negative things about me, by the way, because I try that. You think you're holier than thou. You think you're so righteous. It's like, I don't think I'm anything. Why do you say that? I am nothing compared to the God that I serve. I am a servant myself to others. Live our lives as a, as a, selfless sacrifice on the behalf of others. If me drinking offends you, guess what? I won't drink. And people would say, oh, you can do that though. All things are liberal. I like cigars. If it offends you, I won't smoke them. I will discount everything in my life if it will encourage the body of Christ. But that's not the role of a pastor. That's my position in my sonship with my Lord. That's how we're to live our lives. Someday I'm gonna get into the scripture. Just share this as a, as, a, as a prelude to the fact that three weeks ago when I preached that there, there are spirits and doctrines of demons, it's real folks. Do you not know that? That in the last days, there will be a great falling away but you know what I think? I think the remnant of the church will be all that's left, but there will be this grand explosion for God. And this great separation is going to be this one world church that is the answer. And will they, will they say things in Jesus' name? I'm sure that they will. Because they will worship what many Christians like, and that's the bobblehead Jesus. Whatever I say, Whatever I do, however I interpret anything, there's Jesus. Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm going to say this and that and the other. Mm -hmm, yes, yeah, absolutely, do it. All things are lawful, all things are lawful. 
The Bible hit Jesus. That's what people are worshiping today. A little bobblehead with a sticky on the front. They're like, I worship Jesus. Now, sadly, there are Christians who worship the true and living Christ as their savior. But in their lives, they worship the bobblehead that sits on the dashboard. I'm pulling from a story that you had given about the guy. You know, was it Peru? Yeah. India. Just a bobblehead. Golly. Do we really want to serve a God that says, hey, Lester, you asked me something. Say I'm God for a second. <laughs> Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Let's not even do that anymore. You're talking to God. And God says, well, what do you think, Lester? I want your opinion. I want you to tell me what you want. Well, I think that we should do this. I think you're right. Do it. I've listened to pastors that have said things that made me picture this bobblehead Jesus. That just going along. Should I get another plane? Should I get a bigger plane? Well, what do you think? Well, I don't think I should because it's going to look, no, no, no. What's the desire of your heart? Well, maybe, you know, it would be nice to have something newer. Right. Absolutely. Live an abundant life. Live your abundant life now. And that's the focus of today. I'm only going to preach for another maybe 20, 30 days. No, I'm kidding. 20, 30 minutes. I, <laughs> this is going to go on and on and on. This is a book. But I want to break this down very subtly in the fact that there are spirits that are trying to seduce the body of Christ and create doctrines of demons. And secondly, how can I determine these things was a message two weeks ago. And that message was about what? How do I know truth? How do I study the word of God? How do I do these things? Do I exegete the scriptures or do I eisegete? Do I put myself in there all the time as the preeminent and narsegete the scriptures? How can I study these things? And it was a short message. They, they, they have semesters, semesters on proper exegesis of the scriptures. Because today with the, all the versions that are out there and with all the teachings that are out there, you can put together all kinds of things that creates a bobblehead Jesus. This galactic God, this genie in the clouds that'll give you whatever you want, whatever you ask for, whenever you want it. I'm thankful that he loves me and I'm thankful that he loves you, amen? I'm thankful that we have promises and I'm thankful that we have hope. Amen. I'm thankful that we serve a God who's merciful. And I'm certainly thankful that he's patient and long-suffering. Hallelujah. I just am. I had such a, a great release of peace on Thursday as I thought about time with the Lord in eternity, beyond this life. And there was so much peace that was garnered from that that there was no more confusion. There was no more complaining. There was no more strife. There was no more death. There was no more crying. There was no more disease. It doesn't exist. And I thought, Lord, why don't you just come now? Wouldn't that be awesome? Lord, come now. Come now. And then he reminds me of all those that would perish and go to hell. All those right now that are alive, that, that have an appointment with me or with someone else that loves him. Would you want me to come now? And I thought, oh Lord, I actually made that about myself, didn't I? Wow, how easy it is to make this life about us because we should have an abundant life. Last week, I preached on the holiness of God without going into the fullness of his character. Ultimately, it rests in one place, and that is his holiness, his holiness. And therefore, we are to be holy. Do you remember that message? Amen. Amen. And so there are a series of questions that we have within the church today that causes chaos. And those aren't 
answered easily? They should be, but there's so many voices on these topics. And so it addresses these things to add clarity to the church today, at least as best as I understand it currently. And I've been pouring myself over the atonement and I am not ready because I can't get out of the Old Testament. (laughs) I mean, when you start studying something, you start from the beginning and you start looking at all the things that were done, the intricate details of the sacrifices and how they were sacrificed or sent off. And just then I get into the tabernacle and seeing Christ in all things and every single thing. So I'm kind of stuck there. I can see the picture. I can see where it's going, of course. But I don't want to miss anything in this journey of understanding what Christ has really done for us because we just relegate it to death, burial, and resurrection, and we move on. As a matter of fact, if I were to preach the atonement every single week and what Christ has done for us, we would get bored. Nobody wants to hear about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ every single week. I wanna grow, I wanna know something, I wanna learn. Isn't there something esoteric in the scriptures that we can look? Let's go into numerology real quick and let's see what we can do with it. Oh my goodness. There's a lot of mysticism that's added to the word of God. And there's a lot of things with regards to uh, new age, new thought, word of faith, things that we see that are added to the scriptures and it's manipulated and it's mutilated in the world today. And we wonder why there's no power in the church. There's a lot of reasons. So let me start here in uh, John chapter 10, maybe another 10, 15 minutes. I'm not gonna preach long messages anymore. I'm gonna cut you off. And if you wanna come back next week and listen, amen. If not, you know, more power to you. (laughs) God is good. I'll ask, where are you? John chapter 10. The piece that I have is this. I wanna share truth with you, I do. And I want to study these things because you might not have 40 hours to study these things. You might have the opportunity to watch a 10 minute video and get your theology and your doctrine from there. But I'll take the time. I have it. And so I'm going to utilize it for the good of God's people. And then I want to investigate these things and I want to come and I want to present truth. And I can't make you receive it. All I can do is present it and you can reject it altogether if you want to. And if there are certain things, then we'll have a conversation and we'll try to work these things out because I want to. Do you? A lot of things that we hear is is that we can have our best life now. And we hear that God has plans for us, not to harm us, but to give us an expected hope. He wants good things for us. And this is true because it's scripture. And I'm not denying what I've just said. But in the context of that statement, when we look at it, the Israelites are about to go into 70 years of bondage. And the weeping prophet Jeremiah says, I know the plans that I have for you, not to harm you, but to prosper you as you go into slavery and bondage. We know that scripture says that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. We know these things to be true, right church? We agree that that is true, but then we ascribe to God our will and say it's his because we want to live this abundant life today. Now, I'm thankful for the provision that he makes for me, and I'm thankful for the provision that he makes for you. I'm thankful for the protection that he provides for us as we go about every single day. But I want to be very safe and give him all the glory because there are times that I have prayed for people and God has seen it, his will and perfect desire to allow that to happen. 
And then they come to me and say, thank you, pastor. But it wasn't me. It was God. Give him glory. I get it. Thank you so much for appreciating the message. Thank you so much for saying that. But listen, it's misplaced. Just as the apostles, when people were healed, they they gave God the glory very quickly. Do you think we've done this? No, this is the Lord, Jesus of Nazareth. They're very quick to redirect any worship, any platitudes, any praise. It's not me, it's him. The very fact that he's using me is an irony. (laughs) It's ironic. I think it to be moronic at times, but amen. He sees fit. And then that brings great pleasure to me. Lord, (laughs) wow, me? You're too good. You're so good. Because when I think about what I deserved and you spared me from all that, Wow. And then use me. Wow. I'm in awe over God every once in a while. I hope you are too. So John chapter 10. John chapter 10. It's a great chapter, by the way. There's so much in here. I always want to recommend, and if the word context begins to seem like something that's bad, then rebuke that spirit and get right with God. Because context is everything. In real estate, realtors will tell you, what's the most important three things in real estate? Location, location, location. And when it comes to the interpretation of scripture, context, context, context. God meant his word to mean something. So we have to understand what it means and not isolate a passage of scripture out and use it for whatever we want. I can throw any amount of scripture you want at you to prove any point that I want, but I want for you to be able to go into the scripture and I want you to be able to discern for yourself. I really don't want you to believe the doctrines of Eric Philpott. I want you to believe the doctrines of Christ according to his word. And I want to do everything that I can so that you're equipped to be able to do that if the Lord should see fit to take me tomorrow. And if he is, praise him. Praise him. Take care of my wife. I've made all preparations to do best I can while not being present. But you won't have to pray for me or poor Eric. I will be with the king of glory. There should be some kind of party, amen? A fiesta, la fiesta, woo! All right, anyway, that's all I got. I'm not gonna do any more Spanish, not from the pulpit. John chapter 10, verse 10 is the one that I wanna look at, but I don't feel safe having said what I just said by not reading before and after. So very quickly, let me do this. John chapter 10, verse one. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice." And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh. This is the passage of scripture that's quoted most often out of this John chapter 10 is verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. 
Listen, following. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling, and this is where, sadly, I insert myself as a pastor. I'm just being honest, as I was reading this the first time, I'm very quick to find if I'm narcissizing the scripture, making this about me. Because who's this about, by the way? This is about Jesus. And I, don't, I want to be very quick not to insert myself in place of Jesus. So I share this with you out of honesty and transparency of how I can do this too. It might have an application to me. But I can't lose the fact that this is talking about Jesus. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. And the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep, and am known of mine, and the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself and I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. The commandment have I received of my father. Is that beautiful? What the Lord has done for us. And in the middle of him being the way, being the door, that he is the only way, the the exclusivity of Christ and his declaration here. And then in the middle of this, just kind of almost out of place, it seems, if we we take it out of place, says that, that you have an abundant life and that we're supposed to have this abundant life. And then he follows it up and he says, I am the good shepherd and I'll lay my life down for you because the abundant life is in Christ alone. It has nothing to do with what's out here. This world is decaying. This world will be judged. And I'm thankful that we serve this God who laid down his life and then provides for us and his long suffering towards us and is patient with us. We have a lot to learn from him in those areas, by the way, do we not? I know I do. But he, he, he starts it off saying that everyone else that comes any other way are robbers. If it's not about Jesus, it's about nothing. If it's not about Jesus and it's about us, that is weak and is a very weak, weak imitation of who Jesus is. I inserted myself here because I just empathize, I guess, with the laying down your life that you'll give yourself and you'll you'll exhaust yourself and you'll exert yourself for the sheep. And sheep do sheep things. (laughs) I know I do to the Lord as one of his sheep. I'll argue with him and bite at him and I'll hear what he has to say, but then do something else. A teacher said to me uh, and has said to many, I don't even know why you come to class because you don't, you don't exert yourself. You don't do anything towards the assignments. You haven't done your homework. I have no other idea why you come to class. And so after a week of skipping the class, sitting in the principal's office, I said, the teacher told me that they didn't even know why I came here, that I shouldn't come to class, that they had no idea why I was. Now tell me that's not a poor interpretation of what was said. But yet all about me in 15 years old, I somehow took what the teacher said and did what I wanted to do. And so... In this, as we're going through, it's kind of slowly unpacking some of these things. It's it's looking at the scripture for what it says. And it's not 
Because we know that there's life and death in the power of the tongue, right? But it's taken to such an extreme that some would believe that the things that we say actually have creative powers behind them in that they can create things and and then we'll use scripture and we want to address those things and look at them in their context of what was being said because I pray to God that we're humble enough that if we can see what God's word says that we can say, oops, my bad, I was wrong. I was wrong. I want for God to be right. And his word is very clear unless we talk about verse 10 out of context. And and here, God wants you to have an abundant life. He wants you to have an abundant life. He wants for only good for you. He's already said that. He doesn't want to harm you. If something, and they start to add things to it, that if something's going wrong, then, then it has to be something you've done or something you're doing or 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 something along these lines, or they get into this spiritual warfare aspect that is outside of scripture. And, and it's really mystic in many ways. I heard a, a lady preaching and uh, I'm, I'm not interested in mentioning any names at this point in time, but I will just say that they took third John chapter one, verse two, third John chapter one, verse two, that if you read this in context, if you go to 3 John chapter 1 and you, and you read the first eight verses, he almost mentions truth in every single verse. Truth, truth. And, and Paul is saying that, or John is saying that he is so blessed to hear that they are walking in truth. And it's, it's bringing him great joy and a blessing. And so you really can hammer in, 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 uh, in third John chapter one, you can really hammer on truth as, as a, as a pastor. I mean, it, it sticks out and it's separated into four or five different places. I mean, it's going to, it's a great sermon on truth. But what I heard was her take the greeting and the greeting only verses one and two. And the first verse is just talking about an elder uh, speaking to Gaius. And the second verse says this, and we've often talked about this as far as our fellowship is concerned. We mention this as far as our soul prospering and that we prosper when we come together. That, That truth abounds. We worship the only true and living God. There's no way that our soul can't prosper in coming together as a church. Hallelujah. But this verse was used this way in this introduction. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health, even as thy soul prospers. It was the only time that there was a reference to this passage of scripture and said, see, God wants you to prosper and he wants you to be in good health. This is what he wants. And the whole sermon was about prosperity, wealth, and health. It was a word of faith preacher. And she she brought it. She brought it around this one verse. The problem with this as the source text is it doesn't match saying that God wants all these things when the reality of this is a greeting. And this is John saying, I wish, I pray, I hope that you are prosperous, And that you're in good health as much as your soul is prospering. And we can take this and turn it into something. And one of the things that you have to be careful with with seducing spirits are passages of scriptures that are difficult. And there are passages of scriptures that are difficult. This is the place to insert false doctrine. To make it say what it doesn't say. This is a greeting. I can't build doctrine out of this greeting. It's a great example of how I should probably greet others, especially in writing them. I hope, and I do, I hope that you are prosperous. And I hope that you are in good health as much as your soul prospers. Is your soul prospering? Yeah, I've got this great church that I'm going to. And you're having a good conversation about the Lord. But to take this as a source text is very, very dangerous. Now you can add to this 
but you have to identify what it is. This is not God saying that you are going to be wealthy or be healthy. It's a greeting. And we need to be able to read these things for what they are. It is scripture. It is a great example. But the way I saw this sermon built around health and wellness, which is the prosperity gospel, it was another gospel. We can all agree on that, right? That the prosperity gospel is in fact another gospel? I hope so, because I don't wanna have to do a whole sermon on the prosperity gospel and the differences and the contrasts. I hope that we can see these things, what's not the truth and what is the truth. But in my dissertation, I will write it out so that it's clear. I just don't know that I need to clarify that here, do I? Okay. I will clarify it in this so that younger people that are coming to faith in Christ and are getting involved in other churches that are preaching these things that they can see or come out. Now, who's going to see it? I don't know. Who are you going to give it to? Maybe nobody. Make a paper plane out of it. But this particular passage of scripture was just that one. So 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, he says, I wish above all things, John speaking to this church, I wish above all things that thou may, mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Jesus, as we looked at prefacing this, John chapter 10, verse 10, shows himself as someone who's willing to give his life and the abundant life is eternal life. It's not necessarily in this life. A lot of the gospel that we can preach here in America won't fly in persecuted countries. The things that we're trying to export to our brethren here aren't going to translate there because there is suffering. Some of the gospel that's portrayed here in America that Corey Ten Boom would have kicked you out of their bunkhouse. That Dietrich Bonhoeffer would have called you a heretic in those times and under that persecution. That they made it about God and the future with him. And it wasn't so much about us and our prosperity. That's a very American standard of living that, that makes this prosperity gospel uh, so appealing because we can, we can get it. We can get it. So let me just quickly, and I'm not gonna finish right here. I didn't get very far. I hope you hear my heart. My desire is for us to be in one accord with Christ. My desire is to expose these things and hopefully teach you how to, to read scripture because I can go to the Greek and the Hebrew. I can do all kinds of things to manipulate, but if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Just because I throw you a Hebrew word doesn't mean I'm right. And just because I lay 10 or 15 passages of scripture down out of context, like this one particular passage of scripture that thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, that you might have an abundant life. And these, if I just take the other half of this, that I can build a doctrine out of that and take so much, you have to know. And I want to warn anyone that teaches, please honor the Lord. If you believe that our words have power, then believe that it has the effect to help or to hurt, at least, right? At the minimum. Now, here's something. This is God's word. This is more important than anything that we can possibly say. But if we say that we're speaking on behalf of God and it's inaccurate, brothers and sisters, that borderlines blasphemy. That you are representing a holy God. That's why a lot of people say, well, Pastor, I think you take this too seriously. You, you, you'd have probably better health if you didn't take it so seriously. I have been called to be a minister of God's word. What I hold here is so precious and it's so weighty. And for me to say that I'm going to speak on behalf of God, I want it to be true. I, I, don't, I don't care how long it takes to figure it out. I just don't want to be a fool. I don't want to be ashamed before my Lord. Amen? And us as Christians, we should be in that same place. Amen? We should, we should value this word above all things. Have you had an experience? Does that trump the word of God? Do you have a testimony? Does that testimony refute the word of God? Does it cancel the word of God? 
No, we encourage one another by testimonies. There's no doubt about that. But we don't build theology out of these things. I've had many a testimony up here and I have even made the mistake of talking about my dreams and visions that I've had. And, and I make these things a, a mention of them and I haven't fully interpreted them or maybe I don't even have it yet. Maybe I'm still working through these things, but then others, they're willing to interpret themselves and everything that they have without anything exterior, even the word of God. And theology is built out of dreams instead of the word of God. What I'm saying is the word of God trumps anyone's declaration, anyone's decrees. It has been established. Let the word of God, please listen. Let the word of God, I'm not trying to make you do anything. Let the word of God be your guide because there are seducing spirits. And by the way, Satan knows scripture better than you and me put together. He knows how to manipulate this book. It's why we see what's going on out there today. We have to, Lord, what are you saying? What do you mean? My dreams can be demonic, can they not? They can seem interesting, but I can be invaded. Has anybody ever been attacked in their sleep by a demon? It happens. We're very vulnerable in that state. So we have to be careful. Defining an abundant life is to live life in truth. That's abundant life. I don't care where you put this physical body. When I think of Corey Ten Boone and all of her things that she went through and she was in this concentration camp with fleas that she could praise and encourage everyone else to praise God for the fleas. Praise God for the fleas. It was an abundant life because they were operating in truth because the fleas were preventing the Nazi soldiers from coming in and beating them, raping them, or killing them. The fleas in the life, praise God for this. An abundant life, it doesn't matter where you're put. When you see uh, Peter and they're in prison, uh, was it Peter? Was it, uh, they were, he was in prison too. Or am I thinking about Paul? I'm thinking Peter got kicked in the side by an angel that he didn't pray for. Hallelujah. And then you have uh, Paul and Silas that are in prison. And what do they do? Pray, rebuke, do all this stuff. They lived an abundant life in Christ in prison. And what they do, they sing praises to the Lord. Praises. Regardless of where this physical body is or the condition that it's in, I can praise the Lord and see his goodness because that's the abundant life. And it doesn't often exist here and praise him when it does give him the glory some people we think that we got it all down it's like well, yeah that was a pretty good investment i did a good job picking up that property at that point in time and all this other stuff and i could say that about my property but i know for certain that that's something i did not want and the Lord had organized everything knowing the years to come in advance and the things that I would have to go through and made provision in advance without me praying. I didn't even know, but that's how good he is. And I give him all the glory for that because he's worthy because I didn't do it. And I could sit back and say, yeah, I was looking for some real estate, found some good property, got it squared away, sold it for a good penny, looking for some others. I'm going to make some other good investments. no. I'm going to do what the Lord wills. What is your will, Lord? I will pray to him and I will follow the Lord's prayer if necessary. And even if I don't understand, Lord, can you, can you stop this? Can you do this? But yet not my will, but your will be done. I think somebody said that in the Bible a couple of times. So what is abundant life? My goodness, this guy can talk. <laughs> Just long winded. I love the word of God. I love God's people. And there's pain in this pastor's heart, by the way. I'm preaching out of a position of pain for you. And I say that. And I I'm like, Lord, please release me. No. Okay. Because it's difficult to run that extra two laps when you don't have to. God's not going to condemn me. If I walked away from the ministry today, I'm not going to lose my salvation. 
I'm not going to have any eternal uh, damnation that takes place. Matter of fact, I could probably convince myself that I'll be at peace. But if I don't get the release from the Lord, there will be no peace. And what I'm thinking maybe will be there. See, we do this with other things in our lives. Lord, you want me to be happy. And so this is a burden that's difficult for me to bear. So surely you want me to leave and you want me to go and do my own thing that's going to bring joy to me. And we do this with all kinds of things. And somehow we make this about us. We're to love not our lives unto death. That's a passage of scripture that's left off. We know that we overcome by the word of our testimony, the blood of the lamb. Amen. But loving not our lives unto death, living a sacrificial life for others. And even if I have to keep my mouth shut and I want to talk and I can talk, by the way, and I can be very convincing. I can be persuasive. And the Lord says, be still. But Lord, this and that, be still. This isn't about you. Let me do some work here. Okay. I'm not happy, <laughs> but okay. And then there's other times where I'm told to speak. And I'm like, Lord, maybe I should hold my peace. <laughs> no, I want you to speak. Yeah, but if I speak about this, this is going to cause all kinds of problems. And I don't want them. I've already got enough going on. Speak truth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I will. Sometimes I don't feel like it. I'm glad I don't go with my feelings. Amen? That we love him and it is truth. Will you get to the point? Yes, Lord. When it comes to an abundant life, when we think of this abundant life, I just want us to consider a few passages of scripture and I encourage you to write these down and I encourage you just to kind of look at it in its context because I'm going to have to, for the sake of time, just share with you a few things that, that pretty much mean what they mean, but I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to explore it for yourself. This is a great opportunity to find yourself in a Bible study or, or uh, with the Lord through the course of the week. I'm thankful that on Wednesday nights that people are speaking about the message and adding to it and looking at scripture and really unpacking it for what it's worth because it's worthy of that. It's God's word. Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. It's pretty clear that this life is not about this stuff. Most of our stuff got destroyed just recently. I don't have to share these things with you. The Lord has other plans and I see that, but our storage flooded. And so all my clothes are destroyed, except for the clothes that you've seen me wear the past few weeks on Sundays. It's like, he's, is he wearing the same jacket? Is that the only jacket he's got? Well, I've got two right now, amen? And I've got blue jeans. But I'm praising the Lord because he's preparing something else He's preparing me to get other clothes. He's preparing me to lose weight. He's preparing me to get fit to where this jacket is just not going to be all the muscles. I don't know what he's doing, but I just know that he's doing something and I can praise him. Or I could sit there and I could try to rebuke this and that and these things and the others, but I am his and he can do with me what he will. I am his. You want to destroy my clothes? Wipe them out. What are we doing? I don't know. I'm going to follow you anyway. Am I bulking up? I hope so, because I would like that. Get back to that state. This 44 doesn't need to fit anymore. I need a 54. No, I'm kidding. That's too much. <laughs> but it's not about the things. See, sadly enough, sometimes when we actually pray, we pray very covetously. And we don't even realize it. We pray for ourselves, for the things that we think that we want instead of, Lord, your will be done. Your desires be accomplished. He said, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Amen. See, eternal life and the abundant life is all about Jesus. It's getting to that place where whether this happens or that happens, Paul says, I have learned in whatsoever state that I'm in therewith to be content. 
that I am perfectly in a place where you want me to be because I'm yours. And it's living in that mindset regardless of what happens. It's how Paul and Silas are able to worship in prison. Most people wouldn't want to do that, would they? Or it's how Peter can rest so peacefully on a cell floor in prison to where an angel has to say, come on, you're getting out of here, let's go. He's like, oh, I had also learned contentment in this, but let him out. I'm interested in following Christ in an abundant life, amen? And that's really kind of the preface of, of exploring these things because it just unpacks one little thing about what abundant life is. John chapter 17, verse three, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. This life, brothers and sisters, is all about Jesus. And I hope you don't get bored of this pastor saying that because I want it to be about him and him alone. Exalt him, make him preeminent in our lives only. And when we feel, when we feel necessary to claim anything for ourselves, let us watch it, let us check it, let us examine it. Is this something that would honor the Lord? Because I don't wanna bring glory to me. I wanna bring glory to him. And here's, here's the rub, I'm selfish. That's the rub in all of this. I want stuff. I want new clothes. I didn't want my clothes to go away. I didn't want to have to sell my Cadillac. I didn't want to have to do this, that, and the other. I want, I need me. And my prayers are about me, myself, and I. And us three together, we're a problem. And they're a problem for you too. They're a problem in this world. Beware of covetousness. It's not what abundant life is all about, about us. Abundant life is about being in a relationship with God. And all others, all other things really seem like a cheap, uh, just seem cheap compared to him, don't they? The things that we, that we do and say, I mean, I'm thankful. If we can make it all about him, then there's certain promises that things will follow us and that there, that this God that we serve who loves us will protect us and, and, and navigate us through very difficult waters. If we're following him, he didn't say, deny yourself, take up your cross and lead me. That's the bobblehead Jesus. That's the bobblehead Jesus that we try to manipulate. That's the Holy Spirit that we try to manipulate. We try to get him to do stuff for us because we have not uh, we haven't taken heed and we've embraced some covetousness when it's about us. That's what pride's all about, really. I hope this message today ministers to you. I hope the Holy Spirit can use this in your life. I really don't want to make this about me. I want to make this about him. I want cross life to grow because it's all about him and it's not about us. That it's about the hurting and it's about teaching them about Jesus and seeing them enter into his fold to have their names written in the Lamb's book of life and then to see that they're baptized and to see that they observe all things whatsoever commanded and know that he is always with us and get to this place where they're saying, this isn't about me, this is about Jesus. This is about him. I hope that we can get there. I hope that I, I can help. I just know that uh, when, we, when we contrast what scripture is saying, even about abundant life, and I've only taken a few passages of scripture and maybe we can expound more, but we're just gonna be out of time because. I want us to take time to pray over one another and take time to give testimonies of what God has done in our life. And I don't want to eat it up because that's important too. But when we contrast this with this cosmic vending machine or this genie in a cloud, this bobblehead Jesus, as I've said, um, it takes away from all the work that Christ truly has done because this life's going to end.
brothers and sisters, this is temporal. This is going, this is fading away faster. As a matter of fact, the older I get, the faster time goes. Now, I don't know how that's happening, but it is. When I was a teenager, man, things were just stretched out forever. Remember the summers when you're a, when you're in elementary school? Man, those things were forever. They were fantastic. And then they got shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Now we don't even have one <laughs> that were off. But now I'm 50 years old and just getting older and just seeing that I've got more life behind me than ahead of me. And Lord, what is this life really about? Oh, it's about you. It's all about you. And I've made so much of my life about me. And there's so little time left to really change this and make it all about you. So has it been about him or has it been about us? This uh, prosperity, health, and wealth, and this other gospel that's out there with the prosperity gospel makes it about you, makes it about now, makes it about all these things are about you and who you are. And yes, we are children of the Most High God, but we really are really fast to get selfish with some stuff, to covet things. And we really need to make it about Him only. Amen? I pray that we, going through this, we're going to touch on some things that are going to seem controversial among some of you. And it's not my intention to make this controversial for the sake of controversy, but it is for the sake of truth, that we can look at these things together. And some things we're going to be able to agree to disagree. Hallelujah. We don't see eye to eye on this. But sadly, there are many things that are fundamental. They're foundational to our Christian walk our faith, whether we're Christians or not even. And some people are entering into these things and they think that this is the abundant life, their best life now, 12 steps to your best life now, the Joel Olstein style of living your life in Christ. And I, well, I told myself I wasn't going to mention anybody's name, but, but you know what I'm, ta- what I'm talking about. So... Um, Yes, Lord. I'm not, I'm not saying that he just spoke to me. I'm just saying that I know it's done <laughs> and I want to be obedient. As we look forward, we're going to look into uh, statements like it's more blessed to give than to receive and, and how that's associated with some of the prayers that we're seeing that are infiltrating the church. Uh, looking at Mark 11 and Matthew chapter 21 where we're talking about the Lord saying that whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believing that you'll receive them and all things whatsoever you pray, believing that you receive. And the way we can pray in the church is very selfish and it's about our will and not necessarily God's will because he wants to fulfill the desires of our heart and he does and that's not wrong. But at the same time, is the desires of our heart right? Or is it lined up with some of this covetousness? And so we're going to explore some of these things together. And I want to do it with this spirit. I want to do it with this compassion and with this concern and with this care. And I'm praying through the course of the week that we can be very cognizant of one another as we engage with one another, as we minister to one another, that we truly look to edify one another. And sometimes that might require us to shut our mouths. And for other times, it may require us to speak. But let us make sure that if we can't say it in a way where it's going to be edifying. And listen, even if there's correction, it can be done in an edifying way, right? Amongst one another. The only people that I'm really ever very harsh with are people that, that are considered in leadership of cross life. That, that would be the only place that you would actually see it. So if you want me to maintain this compassion, then just don't come into leadership. Otherwise, we're going to address things. But you'll see, you'll see that I want to be a model of Christ. And even the way I do it is out of concern. And I pray that you can see that. I pray that you can see that. And I pray that we would, that we would comfort one another this way. Hallelujah. Amen. The church is under attack today. And I know that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. But if seducing spirits are coming in and distracting us and getting it off course, then I believe that Satan thinks that he can kick the can down the road of the Lord returning. 
And therefore, I can see how he perceives a victory in all of this because the Lord hasn't returned for judgment. And there are certain things that the Lord has laid out uh, for his return. And we can see this. And this has to do with our eschatology and how we view end times. And this isn't a place that the church really looks a lot at. As a matter of fact, you can see a lot of people that they don't necessarily look towards the end times, that they're looking very now. And this is where, like what we talked about a few months ago, I was only going to preach till 630, so I'd look at the clock. Amen. Still on time. Um, when I was talking about the NAR and the New Apostolic Reformation and understanding that their theology is infiltrating the church, so much so the, the seven mountain mandate is becoming a part of this as if we're going to be able to restore everything before the Lord return, before the Lord's return. And what I'm saying is that's the exact opposite of what the Bible says is going to happen. And so it puts people in this mindset where they're not looking for the return of the Lord. They're looking to establish kingdoms here and now and oftentimes for themselves. And so, uh, nevertheless, we'll be looking at that list of things that I had mentioned about three weeks ago when we started this. We're going to touch on every single one of these because I believe that it will bring order and it will bring unity to the church for these things to be exposed for what they are and hopefully purified and driven out the things that we know are heresy that's in our own thinking. And I'm thinking back to the way I've prayed in the past, things that I learned from somebody else and the way I prayed, wholly unbiblical, the way I prayed. I really made it about me in those prayers. And we grow and the Lord is gracious to us, amen? So we should afford and extend grace and mercy to each other. And I want to do that through this series, hallelujah, because he's good. He's been gracious, amen, amen. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you intended your word to mean something. And Lord, I pray that we can approach your word that way. Lord, we want to hear from you. Lord, our desire is to glorify you, not to glorify ourselves. Lord, you will do that. Our role is truly to humble ourselves and you will exalt us. And when we exalt ourselves, uh, we tend to get squashed down pretty fast. Lord, we are thankful that we are yours. We are thankful that we are blessed. We thank you for your provision. We thank you, Lord, for your protection. We thank you that every good gift comes from your hand. And we're thankful that even when we don't understand the situation that you do, that uh, when a situation catches us off guard, it doesn't catch you by surprise, even though it caught us by surprise. Lord, you are fully sovereign and providential over all things. Lord, you can, in fact, do anything that you want to do. And we just counted a great joy that you use us. Lord, even making that statement, we can be guilty of elevating ourselves. Lord, we thank you for salvation. We thank you, Lord, that you gave us what we did not deserve, and that is grace. And we thank you, Lord, that you're withholding what we do deserve and showing your mercy. Lord, I pray that we would live a life full of grace, full of mercy. Lord Jesus, if there has ever been a time that the church needs you, it is now. And Lord, even as we look to scripture, I pray that we could find ourselves in a humble place before your throne and would petition you for these things. Lord, that we would ask, hoping to receive, that we would seek, that we might find. And Lord, that we would in fact knock, that the door would be open to us. Because what we have a tendency of doing, Lord, is not asking, but demanding and decreeing. We don't seek because we've already found. Follow us. And there's no need to knock on your door because you've already given us the authority. So now it's just time for us to execute. Lord, help us to see these things for what they are. 
and the elements that are true in that. Lord, let those rise in our spirit. Lord, let them be confirmed by your word. And Lord, let your Holy Spirit guide us to all truth. And we pray this in the mighty and the matchless name, the most precious name, the name above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen.